also writes the tradition of John's last admonition, little children love one another, and his refusal to be in the same house with, uh, with uh, uh, Serinthius is an excellent illustration of the way how for him love and love of Christ and strict rejection of heresy uh, belong together. Uh, Sasso, in a numerous places, uh, including also in Here We Stand, uh, makes the observation that John, the great apostle of love, thinking of particularly of 1 John, uh, with this constant theme, little children love one another, is most uh, uh, kind of firm in absolute rejection of error. And that in the modern day, in the modern church, uh, it becomes a matter of truth or love. And that those who uh, contend for the truth are said to be unloving or letting truth triumph over love. For Sasa, uh, he argues that, or Sasa argues that First John, uh, love can only express itself in truth. And that the great apostle of love is the great apostle of truth. That you do not have this counterpunctual kind of polarity. Uh, but uh, love of the word of God, love for the neighbor, love for the brother, bound together uh, in the truth. And so in here we stand, uh, there's a, a line that, uh, uh, that uh, kind of parallels Sasa's argument in this essay, where he says, although John's gospel and epistles constantly set forth the love of one's brethren as the criterion, for true faith and genuine Christianity, his criterion for, er for er erroneous faith and heresy is a dogmatic statement. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, citation from 1 John. And then Sasa uh, comes back kind of to the current um, situation which he addressing this essay uh, to uh, the question of, uh, of, of selective uh, fellowship, he raises the question whether or not the so-called Galesburg rule is even recognized in the ELC or the ALC of his day. Uh, the Galesburg rule, do you remember that? From Galesburg, Illinois. Um, it was a rule that the Missouri Senate had never adopted uh, because the Missouri Synod saw it as too loose, but uh, uh, in its own context, it was a way of trying uh, on the part of uh, this more of a more confessional wing here of coming to terms with some kind of understanding of church fellowship. The Yellsburg rule um, went basically like this. Uh, Lutheran pulpits for Lutheran preachers only. Uh, Lutheran altars for Lutheran communicants only. Uh, exceptions are a matter of privilege, not of right. And, um, and that was seen as kind of uh, the standard that, uh, uh, that if you're going to be in a Lutheran pulpit, you're going to be a Lutheran preacher. If you're going to be at a Lutheran altar, you're going to confess the catechism, at least, small catechism. And in that way, it was somewhat minimalistic, I guess. Uh, but it was a way of trying to, uh, to, to move in a, uh, away from, from open, what would have genuinely been open communion in the uh, 19th century. Uh, but Zasa wonders, in 19, even in the mid-50s, if the Gelsberg rule were actually intact in the old ALC in terms of actual practice. It was certainly there on paper, but... Uh, he had traveled enough in the United States and had enough correspondence with people in the United States uh, to know that what is on paper is not always reflective of what actually happens in terms of, uh, in terms of, of church practice. Um, what's that? He knew the Missouri Synod well. He did. Um, he talks about open communion as no communion at all. 
He says open communion is not communion at all. It may be a fascinating religious, a fascinating rite, a religious experience, but it is not the sacrament of the New Testament. I mean, if you think of it simply linguistically, open communion is a oxymoron. It, 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 a communion by very nature does what? It's inclusive, but in its inclusivity, there are always those who are outside the circle. You know, even a, a statement such as, uh, we admit only baptized Christians to the Lord's Supper is in reality not open communion. An open communion would actually probably be the practice of a lot of ELCA congregations that place no strictures at all. I mean, uh, you know, in the uh, ELCA, the current debate on communion practice is whether the unbaptized should be communed. Uh, and, and, and from what I hear in, from connections in the ELCA, uh, probably the majority of congregations in the ELCA do not even make baptism a prerequisite for coming to the sacrament. And that would be, I mean, uh, that would be consistent uh, because com uh, communion is always going to have some closure. The question is, at what point do you draw, you know, at what point do you draw the line? Uh, but Sasa is arguing that open communion could not be the sacrament of the New Testament, uh, that, uh, that the altar uh, presupposes uh, baptism in the word, uh, that there, are, there are, are lines there. I mentioned uh, today that um, um, Sasa alludes to this matter of uh, emergency, and I couldn't recall the place, but it's actually here in this essay. And he says that we cannot use exceptions to abolish the rule. That uh, obviously there are going to be uh, exceptions made in terms of uh, who might be communed. But he says the exceptions by their very nature are life and death circumstances. Uh, and even in the case of kind of life and death, doesn't automatically mean uh, that one will be communed. Do you know the story of Hugo Grotius? Uh, he was a uh, Dutch, very significant Dutch jurist, philosopher, uh, theologian, uh, and he was on a sea journey back to uh, the Netherlands, and his uh, ship was involved in a storm, this is 1700s, uh, off the coast of Latvia. And the Latvians who were Lutherans rescued him, uh, but he was, uh, he was, he was uh, injured and, uh, and, and uh, actually he was dying after the shipwreck. And uh, he dies being cared for by these Latvian Lutherans. And after he dies, the, uh, uh, the Latvians write, his, uh, write a letter to his family back in, the Netherlands, and they uh, comment that uh, they did what they could for, the, for, for Grotius and, and cared for him the best they could, and that they heard his Christian testimony and confession and prayed with him. But you will, of course, understand that we did not administer the holy sacrament of Jesus' body and blood to him because he, had, he was still confessing the Calvinistic faith. So not every matter of life and death becomes even there an occasion for the administration of, of the sacrament. But Sasa's point is, and again, it, it, you know, you see this unfolding in American Lutheran history, that the exception becomes the rule. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and Sasa alludes to that here. Sasa concludes the, um, um, uh, the essay by um, stating that um, the unity of the Lutheran church can come only if our churches return to the diligent use of the means of grace, to a serious study of the word of God, and to the confessions 
of uh, the Reformation. And, and so the piece on selective fellowship is, um, in many ways, uh, a very uh, kind of typical and helpful example of how Sasa comes to look at what is entailed uh, in church fellowship. Uh, in, in, in a general way, he's writing over against this kind of background in the United States, uh, sympathetic as he is to the cause of Lutheran unity, uh, but not unity at the, uh, uh, at, at the price of unclarity or diminished uh, confessional uh, capacity. But the anomaly is, is that perhaps if Missouri and the old ALC would have gotten together, there may have never been an ELC yet. That may have been, uh, or the, the flip side of that is that, again, you never know because you, you can't uh, second guess what would have happened uh, historically. Uh, I think Sasa was worried about the other possibility that the Missouri Synod's, what, Sasa by this time said, I can only see dark days ahead for the Missouri Synod. And, 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 and even in, in the 1960s, uh, when after the Pittsburgh or the uh, Detroit Convention of 1965, where Sasa becomes particularly depressed, uh, I mean he's not there, but he hears about it. Um, he says that the world is simply waiting for the Missouri Synod to capitulate, and then you would have a world free of confessional Lutheranism, because he he recognized that the Missouri Synod, in terms of world Lutheranism, was still kind of the large, at least, large confessional Lutheran church, and that the smaller confessional Lutheran churches would more or less go in the way of Missouri. And he thought that if Missouri collapsed, uh, Wells and ELS were so small numerically that they would just kind of evaporate into complete insignificance, and that uh, you would... Um, you would have a repetition in North America of what he had experienced in, uh, uh, in, in Europe. So again, you know, historically, uh, would it have been different if the Missouri Synod and ALC, who came in so many ways so close in 1950, if that would have, if that would have come to fruition, uh, or would it simply have perhaps delayed uh, uh, kind of a slide toward uh, an inevitable deconfessionalization. Hard to say. What was the review for me? What was the thing at the Pittsburgh Convention? I'm uh, Pittsburgh, a uh, Detroit Convention. The Detroit Convention. Um, that was the, in many ways, kind of a turning, a, a turning point in the convention. Um, Mission affirmations, uh, formation of uh, ILCW, which would eventually lead to LBW, um, but with mission affirmations were actually crafted by Martin Kretzmann, who was a longtime uh, missionary in uh, Nagarkoil, India, brother of AP and O.P. Kretzmann, and, um, and Martin Kretzmann uh, had pushed our partner church in India toward LWF. In fact, they had joined, they joined LWF and was actually, uh, if he would have had his way, would have had the Lutheran church be part of the Church of South India, this ecumenical uh, uh, church. And um, Martin Kretzmann and Sasa had some literary exchanges. I don't have those. They bring those letters with me. But uh, uh, but uh, Sasa saw in Martin Kretzmann um, a combination of Missouri Synod triumphalism and ecumenical splendor. That he was kind of fascinated by the ecumenical big bigness, and he had kind of this. Uh, sense of, you know, of kind of Missouri said, you know, we can do it. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and was, uh, and, 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 and was, um, 
critical also uh, of some of the missiological tactics that uh, Crutzman was taking in India. You remember it's also in this time when uh, you have, uh, uh, well, uh, by the 60s now, when we're talking about this, uh, uh, you have, uh, you know, um, Missouri Synod missionaries, for example, in India, uh, suggesting that you can have the sacrament with coconut juice and banana leaves, uh, or that, per, uh, or that uh, we ought to forego baptism because baptism will pull people out of a Hindu cultural web and set them into a Christian community and make it more difficult to reach out to their Hindu relatives. Um, and, um, and, and in fact, uh, one Missouri City missionary still living who served in India in those days, Herbert Hofer, uh, more recently of Concordia, Portland, uh, wrote a, a book on uh, kind of the, non, the phenomena of non-baptized Christians in India. And so, um, and, and so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of ferment uh, during that, uh, uh, during that during that period, yeah. You comment on uh, page two sixty four where Sasa says the the road toward unity is not just theological faculty. Mm -hmm. getting, yeah, those five seven. The whole church in their station. Uh, you know, my thought would be, uh, we don't want, I, I guess, fellowship where the CTTR says this church body is good to go, and then uh, it shows up for a convention vote. What's the role of the congregation or the pastors to be involved in any of this uh, well, discussion along the way? <laughs> There's a four committee that they could have come to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's their fault, Dad, on it. Yeah. And I, and I really don't know the status yeah. of my second question is what, what are our uh, discussions at the synodical level uh, mm -hmm. with uh, ELS and Wells first. Okay. Well, you got some separate questions. Uh, uh, but uh, I think what Sasa is getting at, and again, you know, uh, in some cases you want the theological faculties involved. In other cases, and I think this is the situation that Sasa was referring to in the 1950s when you had theologians coming together and basically saying, we're good to go. And yet, rank and file parish pastors knowing that out in the congregations, uh, that there was a great deal of divergence, sometimes between what was going on in a Missouri Synod church, and what was going on in the neighboring, in this case, ALC church. And so for Sasa, again, it's not that he gives a recipe for the creation of church fellowship as though you do it through the CTCR, you do it through the president's office, then it comes to convention. Uh, those are thing, Those are uh, kind of pragmatic external church government questions that need to be uh, debated and, and decided upon. Uh, but in one sense, because it is church fellowship, the whole church has to be involved. In other words, uh, you need, if, if, uh, if let's say there was a... Uh, you know, a Tennessee Senate Lutheran church now. Uh, and uh, yeah, 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 you got, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've heard about the uh, emergence of the, uh, well, maybe that's not a good name now. Uh, but uh, uh, the Neo, yeah, the Neo Hinkalite Senate. And, uh, and you have a congregation of the Neo Hinkalite Senate down the street. And there's talk about the Neo Hinkalite Senate coming into fellowship with the Missouri Senate that uh, it's not a matter simply of the CTCR investigating uh, the doctrinal statements of the neo hinkelite Synod and coming to a, give a proposal to the president of Synod who uh, acts on it, to, brings it to the convention and so forth, but that also pastor and, and congregation, they would need to, to know something about each other. Uh, and uh, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the, uh, things that's actually facing this convention and um, is the whole question of our fellowship with the uh, uh, the TAALC, the Association of American Lutheran 
churches. And, you know, there have been a number of local incidences where it seems to me that um, there's, that there have been actions taken that would indicate that they really are not one with us in doctrine and practice. Uh, and um, and there have been several overtures from districts and from congregations to the Missouri Senate to reconsider fellowship. Well, that's not going to happen at, simply at one convention, nor should it, nor should a decision of that weight be, be made to break fellowship at one convention. But Sasa's point was that maybe before we declared fellowship with the TALC back 10 years ago, there should have been more conversation between actual congregations and pastors to see what's happening in these congregations so that when um, a dissident group from a Missouri Synod congregation leaves in Wyoming uh, over closed communion, that they cannot simply go and be received into a, a in mass into a congregation of the TALC or something like that, you see. And, and so I think what Sasa is getting at is that Long courtship, long courtship. Take time to get to know and, and to study the scriptures together. See if there is actually this consensus. And then when the consensus can be firmly established, uh, there would be a declaration of church fellowship, which in, the, in this essay, Sasa doesn't see happening congregation to congregation, but church body, uh, church body. One of the difficulties, though, is um, is that the the attractiveness mm -hmm. of selective fellowship is that um, oftentimes you find more doctrinal and yep. agreement and consistent practice between churches, congregations of different confessions than you do at times within congregations of the same confession. Yeah, and. Um... Um, I agree. I mean, it's, uh, 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 on one, if, if from one dimension, it's very attractive because I know any number of people who are in church, Lutheran church bodies that we are not in fellowship with that I am closer to in doctrine and practice than some brothers in my own, in my own synod. But again, what Sasa is worried about is the temptation of individualism. And, and sometimes uh, it is, you know, it is the cross that we bear uh, to put my individual preferences and my individual convictions even um, uh, to death for the sake of, uh, for the sake of the greater, uh, the greater good of, of, of the church and confession. But it is, it can be a painful thing when you're with people that you know you are, have more in common with doctrinally and some of your own people in the Missouri Synod, yet you can't go to the altar with them. Uh, it's, it's, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, Sasa is not unmindful of that, but he's looking again at kind of a bigger, uh, a bigger picture. And if each does what is right in his own eyes, then you have, um, uh, simply ecclesiastical chaos. Okay, um, let me just um, make a couple of other um, um, uh, there. This, this essay, uh, the question of church unity on the mission field, I think is really important. So I'm gonna spend a little time with that uh, tomorrow morning and we'll just have to kind of see how, how far we get with, with things tomorrow. But I really uh, I think this uh, uh, essay from 1946 is, um, uh, is, is important. Um, I wanted, and maybe I can do this in 10 minutes, probably not. Uh, I wanted to comment on a Gudakinor theological opinion uh, that Sasa wrote in 1969 uh, to uh, pastors in the Darling Down Zone Conference of the Lutheran Church of Australia in Queensland. Um, a conference, a zone conference in the Australian church would be the equivalent of a circuit in the Missouri Synod. And um, the, the, um, 
Circuit had asked Dr. Sasa for a Gudak in the theological opinion on whether or not they might participate in a community Christmas festival uh, with ministers of other confessions. And um, uh, Zasa is going to render a negative answer. He's going to say no, but he, uh, but he is uh, most helpful in the way that he kind of works through uh, the method till he gets to the to the uh, 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 to the to the no, uh, he uh, he begins, and it's interesting. He does, you know, Christmas festival. He doesn't uh, he doesn't probe. Well, what do you mean by festival? You know, is it a service or is it community uh, event? He doesn't get caught up in that kind of uh, uh, that kind of. Well, what are you going to call the thing? Uh, but rather he takes kind of a step back and um, he starts talking about changes that have been made within the Roman Catholic Church and um, notes that in the Roman Church, it is now possible for Roman clergy to participate in ecumenical services. Um, once again, uh, Sasa had lived through many of these changes, and um, he was actually a participant in the first uh, dialogue committee between Roman Catholic and Protestant theologians in Germany uh, after the Second World War. And so he is speaking as one who has uh, an inside knowledge of Catholic, Roman Catholicism personal friend of Cardinal Bia and had uh, spent time visiting him at the uh, uh, Vatican. Um, and, and so uh, Zasa notes that in the Roman church, uh, now the priest can uh, participate in ecumenical services, the word of prayer services, uh, but obviously not in service of the sacrament. Uh, why is this? Uh, not because the Roman church has found that these services are uh, not in conflict with Scripture, but because the magisterium of the church has simply rendered another decision that no longer, post-Vatican II, uh, are uh, these uh, separated brethren uh, to be... Uh, to be kept at a distance in, in word and prayer. And, um, and, and so Zasa is actually, by adducing this, Roman, uh, this example from Roman Catholicism, uh, moving to make the point that our practice of church fellowship is not simply a practice of bureaucratic rightness or wrongness. Uh, our practice of church fellowship uh, ought to be determined uh, by the Word of God and 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 faithfulness, uh, faithfulness to the Scriptures, and so he uh, shows how Rome has changed its uh, position, uh, not again on the on account of of of, of Scripture, but simply uh, the magisterium has uh, uh, has come now to a, another. Uh, another conclusion. Uh, by the way, uh, some of the most uh, uh, kind of humorous reading in Sasa, you know, some of the comments that he makes on Second Vatican Council, he was not a on-site observer, but kept in 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 contact with Bia and others during the uh, uh, during the proceedings of the council. And Sasa says at one point, um, well. In the Second Vatican Council, Rome has canonized old Saint Swingley. And uh, he does that in reference to uh, uh, Rome's reinterpreted Eucharistic theology of, of um, uh, representation in contrast with transubstantiation, something we might get to a bit tomorrow. But then he also says in the Roman Church after the Second Vatican Council, it's hard for a self-respecting pagan to go to hell uh, because 
and he references Kung and, and Rahner and so forth, anonymous Christianity, and, um, and, and that uh, Rome, he, as he sees it, is moving not only toward <clears throat> kind of inter-Christian conversation, but interfaith dialogue and interfaith prayer. And Sasta's diagnosis of that is that um, Rome can do that because they have a different understanding um, than the evangelical church, where in the evangelical Lutheran church, it is uh, law and gospel. In the Roman church, it's the, the nature, uh, grace, continuum. And so uh, in contemporary, in, in, in a lot of contemporary Roman Catholic theologies of religion, of world religions, you have Christ who is present in nature. And as nature is fulfilled in grace, uh, Christ is now made manifest. But for example, someone like Rahner, even though a person here in nature does not know the name of Jesus, may be anonymous Christian, and even in imperfect communion uh, with the church, in that uh, the, uh, uh, the this, this person uh, does what is within him, which is then brought to completion uh, by, uh, by, by grace. And, and so, um, and, 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 and this uh, uh, has application to, I think, what Sasa is talking about is he, as he's talking about the, the approach of the Roman church to a question of interfaith services uh, over against the practice of, uh, of the Lutheran, uh, the Lutheran, Lutheran church. Um, so Zasa lays that out, and then uh, secondly, uh, he um, notes the formula of Concord, follows the New Testament in making a distinction between people who err in the simplicity of their heart and stubborn teachers of false doctrine, uh, which is another way of saying that when we uh, decline church fellowship with somebody, we are not saying of simple believers and Christians in that body that they are not Christian. I mean, uh, typically with closed communion, one of the uh, uh, responses you get, well, by not communing so-and-so, you're telling him that he's not Christian. Uh, we're not saying that. Sasa uh, is, again, saying that we're not talking about individual believers who err in the simplicity of their own heart, when we, we talk about practice of church fellowship, uh, we are uh, talking about the rejection of those who, uh, it, who are uh, teachers of the church, who are representatives uh, of, 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 of the church and, 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 uh, and, 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 and teach, even though uh, they, from the scriptures, should uh, know better. And it, it does, a uh, little study there of some biblical uh, text. I'll let you look at that on your own. And, um, and again, he sees the Roman church as practicing church fellowship, um, not because the practice of church fellowship is mandated by the teaching of God's word, but on the basis of a church tradition that is subject to modification and change by way of an authority Authorita authoritative interpretation of the church. And um, he goes on in the letter to the pastors, we should try to be very friendly toward other Christians by making it clear to them what we are standing for, we can render our true ecumenical service. And I, I would bring this to a conclusion today, and I, as I said, I want to spend a little time at least with the question of church unity on the mission field, because that's a particularly pregnant uh, essay, I think, for, uh, of, of Sasa for today. Um, but for Sasa, uh, not having church fellowship with a church body 
did not mean uh, that Lutherans would simply kind of evacuate and stand in a corner. Uh, he is perhaps uh, one of the most ecumenically active uh, theologians of the early and mid part of the 20th century. He has uh, contacts all over the place. Uh, he, is, he goes to conferences, he presents papers, he writes uh, letters, he visits uh, with Bia uh, in the Vatican, with Reformed theologians in Melbourne and back in, uh, in, in Europe. And, and he sees Lutherans having a particular, providing a particular ecumenical service uh, to the whole of Christianity by actually giving clear, making a clear confession. And, um, and in that way, um, kind of reminds me of a comment that uh, George Farrell made a number of years ago, where he says, uh, the best way to be ecumenical is to be deeply Lutheran, or to recall the words that uh, uh, Cardinal Avery Dulles said shortly after the uh, ELCA had signed on to the JDDJ, when he was asked, uh, well, what do you think about the ELCA, uh, you know, signing on to the JDDJ? And he said, well, if they would ever say no to anything, we could take their yes a little more seriously. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and Sasha shows a different way toward ecumenism. It's not simply a retreat, but it's not, in, but on, on the other hand, but it's not engaging in, uh, uh, in, litur in, in liturgical services where there is no, uh, there is no shared uh, uh, confession. And, and, and Sasha sees uh, Lutherans having uh, a particular responsibility uh, to confess uh, to and for the whole church. And so we don't, we are not to back away from forms where we can make that confession, but he makes this a rather strict kind of distinction between, uh, uh, between, between that and, and, and worship. Uh, the way I put it in a little piece I did on, on Bogia a few months ago, uh, we are all for witness in the public square, but not worship in the public square. Uh, you know, worship has a different location. That's for the, uh, the, uh, for the faithful gathered around the means of grace. We're, uh, and, and, and we don't worship in the public square, but we certainly witness there. And, and I think Sasa shows a way of how, of, of how we do that. Problem is, is that the world has changed radically from Sasa's time. And um, Rome, um, Buddhists, Hindu, uh, Jews, Christians of all persuasions have found some medium of, um, of cooperation in a, in a civil religion, especially in times of crisis. So we're the only odd man out yeah. for all intents and purposes, which doesn't sound all that elegant in terms of witnessing. Yeah, and it's, uh, again, uh, you're back to Sasa's lonely way. And w one of the aspects of Sasa that I haven't had a chance yet to really probe into, and I want to, is uh, uh, his engagement, especially in the 30s, with national socialism as a form of civil religion. They didn't use the language of civil religion in those days. That's the more American a more contemporary kind of expression, but I would uh, suggest in our own day, the great enemy of the gospel is civil religion. It's not just secularism. Uh, secularism, in fact, in one sense is rather tame because secularism pretends a kind of neutrality that we're just gonna, but civil religion is activated by the juices of idolatry. So you use the names, uh, the language, the vocabulary, the symbols of religion. And, in, and because we're in North America, for the time being, it's going to be, for the most part, the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition that gets used. But, um, uh, but it's, it's not the gospel. And then the whole distinction of religion, uh, religion from uh, uh, the gospel. But that is a particularly Christless religion 
temple religion. It, it, yeah. Yes, and it has caught on mm -hmm. amongst those Christian churches in name only who preach a Christless gospel. Right, right. And so for them, church is all about family. It is all about patriotism. It is all about... Mm -hmm. And it's guilt. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Revelation, we're studying Revelation right now, Shepherd of the Hills. Uh, we're in chapter 17, but if you look at the, the middle chapters of the book, he really hammers uh, this idea, John does, mm -hmm. um, of our God does through John, of this idea of civil religion, where you have this religious beast and this political beast that are out there operating. Mm -hmm. uh, and then more and more so, it's going to be turning the church away from Christ to uh, whatever the political beast may be. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it shouldn't surprise us. Yeah. Yeah. I've got another article I, uh, by Ehlert that's just. Uh, hasn't been translated yet, but it's so um, basically civil religion. Again, that's my, it's, Ehlert doesn't use that language, but my paraphrase would be it's civil religion and the ancient church, because he sees this as something that the early church had to, you know, had to encounter, and certainly in the book of Revelation, and then, and, and then, uh, uh, and then, and then later. And I think, um, as I said, I, I think even though Sasa doesn't use the language of civil religion, there's a lot of kind of parallelism with the way religion was co-opted in the public square in in 1930s Germany. It has some parallels uh, parallels there. Did yeah. you say civil religion assumes neutrality? No, secularism often assumes neutrality. Until, except in the face of uh, confessionalism, right? Well... Uh, the usually, I mean, with with secularism, religion is tolerated in the in the in the sphere of the private. It's preferential. Uh, secularism reacts against the a public confession. But when I met, I, I did not mean that secularism itself is simply kind of neutral. Uh, it, it, it's it. Uh, there, there's finally, in, uh, to paraphrase Saint, uh, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, uh, there is new, no neutrality in the Great War, in this Great War, uh, or even better, the words of Jesus, uh, either for or against. That there's no neutral zone, but at, at least, kind of from a sociological perspective, secularism just wants to evacuate religion into the sphere of the private. Uh, so it's. It's okay as private preference, what you do on Sunday morning. I mean, even with the, um, uh, and again, I don't want to go too much over time here, but with the Obama uh, health care mandates, you know, uh, freedom of worship, for example, uh, was being equated. Well, you, you still have freedom to do your church services, but freedom of worship was being made distinct from religious freedom because Presumably, religious freedom would then have to do with the way you organize your healthcare organizations or insurance, and so uh, uh, and and so there was a re rather narrow uh, a suggestion, a rather narrow reading of freedom of worship. Yeah, you can you can do whatever you want in the privacy of your church, just not in institutions, public institutions that may be related. Uh, related to the church, civil religion, of course, is is uh, particularly, um, I think, particularly challenging uh, because it is civil. I mean, it's uh, it, it's you know, you want to have good community, you want to have uh, civility, and religion is seen as a glue that causes that to stick together. Several years ago, we hosted Dr. Alvin Schmidt. Mm -hmm. in Charlotte, and he made a point about this that I thought was very profound with the lay people. He said, you you know, don't ever call it an interfaith service. It is this idea of civil religion. Mm -hmm. But he told them, he said, you do not belong to a religion. You have been given the faith. Mm -hmm. and, and cherish that term that this is the faith of Christ that you've been given. This is not just simply one religion or a religion amongst 
many. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I mean, he he got very technical with the with the whole mm-hmm. aspect. But this is not you. You don't you don't come to church for religion. You're not mm-hmm. even don't even talk about yourself mm-hmm. as being uh, a religious people. This mm-hmm. is this is uh, all all discussion as Christians concerning mm-hmm. today, and that that really divides you from the civil religion mm-hmm. perspective. Mm-hmm.